everyone and welcome back to the Camel Connection podcast. We interrupt our normal Q&A that we have on a Monday, that we release episodes on a Monday because we have a time sensitive offer that you will not want to miss. Um, Camel lovers unite and camel owners and anybody interested in camels needs to watch this film. Um, So we've just finished watching a new film. It's a short film called Judas Collar. It's um, produced and directed by two female producers slash directors. So Alison is the director and Brooke is the producer of this incredible film. What is Judas Collar? Well, um, we're going to cover that in the interview, which we're going to play shortly. But let me just say in this intro that you will want to listen to this interview. There's two things you need to do. You need to listen to this interview and you need to go watch this film. It's only 15 minutes long and it will make you smile, break your heart, possibly make you cry and then leave you perhaps with a deep sense of amazement and wonder and in awe of how intelligent how intelligent camels are. Judas Collar is about a particular collar that in Australia was built for, for feral camels and it was put on a particular feral camel and that camel would obviously um, be amongst a herd and then the shooters come and shoot the herd. The camel with the collar does not get shot and then of course this camel finds a new herd. So there's betrayal there, but also the camel may or may not figure it out. And that's what you need to watch this film for. Absolutely incredible. I literally just finished watching it and I'm just like, oh, I'm like, I felt all those emotions. I I was happy because it was such a beautiful scenery and seeing how intelligent these animals are, um, which most of you know that already by being with camels and working with camels. Um, and just the heartbreak. Um, but let me just say also that this depicts um, how we treat camels in Australia very, as in we as the government body, treat camels in Australia quite accurately. Um, you know, it's nothing that we're, we're proud of. Obviously, me and Russell being camel owners, lovers, you know, we travel around the world to be with camels. Um, we're not proud of it, but it is such a influential body that's um, driving this these shootings of wild, wild feral camels out in the arid zones in Australia. It, it's heartbreaking. Um, so this film is um, such an important film to watch. And the reason that you need to watch it is because um, obviously the more people that watch it, the more... Um, the more that it, it, it gets popular and, and the more awareness that we can make around this subject. And guys, this film has been nominated, not not just nominated, actually won so many awards that I think they've lost count <laughs> as we explain in this interview with them. Um, and also they're actually um, up for the Academy Awards in 2020 in short films. So it is well worth the watch. You've, okay. Now, here's the details. So it's only available to watch from November 4th to 14th. So you've only got 10 days to watch this. Watch it, share it, plug it to all your friends and family because it's not just camel people that are watching this film, obviously. It's it's all, you know, it's been featured in Australia and in the States in all the short film, most of the short film festivals. So it needs to be shared far and wide. So we will put all the links below in this podcast um, in the description so you can follow that and share it far and wide and um, we just know you're going to enjoy it. So without further ado, we're actually speaking today to Alison, who is the director, writer of this incredible film. She did such a wonderful job and Brooke as well, who produced it also. I mean, the whole team did an incredible, credible job, including the camel wranglers because we've been on set with camels before and it it can be tricky. (laughs) Okay, so um, enjoy this interview with them and then go and watch Judas Collar. Or do that first, watch Judas Collar and then listen to this interview. Either way, um, don't miss out because the 14th of November is the final day in which you can watch this film and then it's going offline. Um, It is free to watch. Um, It'll be on YouTube, Vimeo and some other platforms. And like I said, we'll link those things below. Okay, let's hear from Alison and Brooke, the uh, director, writer and producers of Judas Collar. Hello. Hello. Oh. 
<laughs> Hi, how are you going? Good. good. How are you guys going? Very good. Yeah, good, thanks. Thanks so much for making the time for this. No worries. We're in LA in West Hollywood. Very <laughs> different to being in Perth where we normally are. But um, yes, yeah, so we're over here for the kind of... Um, got a couple of screenings and we're doing a, a little bit of an Oscar campaign. So I'm really passionate about this issue. I have been for quite a number of decades. And um, if you remember the big cull um, that was in 2009, um, I was most uh, active in writing to the newspaper and getting articles sent out because I was, um, uh, I, I was sickened. Um, no other word for it, um, uh, in such a waste. And as it turned out, I ended up in Docker River um, for work purposes um, after the cull and I saw the bones, I saw the pit, um, I saw um, the lack of damage that was actually inside the community, outside of the community, just on the outside, yes, I could see it. And... There was a lot of, um, uh, how can you say, there was a lot of questions as to, you know, what was actually being reported and what the reality really was. Um, and at the same time, there were communities out there who had gone ahead and put water points just outside of the community. So the animals got used to that and didn't go anywhere near the communities. And I questioned why it was necessary for Docker River to have uh, such a, a culling program as it did. I mean, it was reported 6,000 camels. Um, I think the official number of, cull of kills was 3,634 or something like that. Um, but yeah, anyway, so I'm curious as to how you came to the point of wanting to do a movie about the Judas collar, which incidentally, one of my camels was the first camel that had a Judas ca uh, collar on it as an experiment for the government. Wow. Yeah. I was actually working on a show called Outback Truckers. Um, I was one of the directors and I'd been out in the Outback for a couple of years filming. And I was about to set up a new show, which was called Outback Pilots. And so I'd started doing a bit of research and came across one company that specialised in the use of Judas collars. And I thought, what the hell is a Judas collar? I'd never heard of it before. And so I started researching and I just was blown away by um, the fact that this kind of scientific device had been given a biblical name for a start. <laughs> and just the the kind of the way that it had used, I guess the most kind of human trait of, of the camel, the kind of the camel's desire to kind of be with a herd, to, to kind of belong to a, a community against it, to kind of um, unknowingly betray all of its kind of friends and family, I thought was just so incredibly tragic. And then to kind of dig a bit deeper and to hear this idea that some of these camels might become self-aware um, that they're the cause of all of this kind of devastation around them and decide to walk alone for the rest of their life was the saddest thing I'd ever heard. Um, and so I was actually going for a promotion. Um, you know, I was kind of talking to my boss about, you know, my new role and I just burst into tears and I couldn't stop crying and I realised that I wanted to tell this story and I wanted to tell it as a drama and not a documentary. Mm -hmm. So I actually quit my job um, as a full-time television director um, and started writing Judas Collar the next day. Wow. Yeah, cool. God, I, just, I got goosebumps as you started talking yeah. about, you know, this, this, the betrayal thing that can happen. And... and I think you're on the on the ball is that and obviously the film probably you know speaks volumes to this is camels are very intelligent and they do figure things out very quite relatively quickly we only know that because we 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 get to train and handle that's our them business, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's who we are um wow so um brooke how did you come into the scene on all this well, Alison called me up and said, uh, there's a initiative, which was the Screen West uh, Elevate 70 initiative, which 
is something that they run pretty much annually at the moment where $70,000 is given to a film production company or f film production group. So writer, director and producer team to go and make a short film, usually as a proof of concept for a larger film or as a calling card to a larger film, which this has ended up being for Alison. And so Alison contacted me to produce the film and we, we worked together towards that initiative. And then we're fortunate enough to get it. So we were one of um, two teams who won out of 70 applications, I think it was. And so then when we got the funds, we immediately started making the film uh, because Alison was four and a half months pregnant at the time. So we needed to get the film made before the baby came. Yes. Uh, so Nothing like a baby coming to get your ass into gear. <laughs> like a good deadline. <laughs> <laughs> And Brooks are really hands-on, kind of someone who, you know, works out the finance and then disappears. So we jumped into a four-wheel drive and took off throughout the state, all throughout the Midwest of Western Australia. And I think we were on the road for like 14 days, just kind yeah. of looking at different locations, really trying to find that beautiful kind of red dirt desert mm -hmm. um, and just the most kind of stunning kind of landscapes across Western Australia that would really help communicate kind of the emotion of, of the film because yeah. there's no dialogue. There's no um, human voices. There's no narration. Yeah. It's just... And so we needed all of those other elements in the film from the score, the sound, the cinematography, all of that had to kind of be part of the storytelling. Yeah. Amazing. Wow. Yeah. And you're describing uh, one of your, uh, uh, your trailers of some of the hardships uh, that you went through uh, whilst you're on the location. Uh, tell us a bit about that. Well, one of them that comes immediately to mind goes, uh, harks back to how intelligent camels are because uh, we were on the salt flats at Lake Austin in Kew and um, Alison had this incredible shot in her mind of what she wanted, which was the camels walking across the salt flat and us getting um, a helicopter or, or a drone shot up high looking down. But the, the camels sort of started walking on the salt flats and were like, you guys have got to be joking. We'll sink in. <laughs> And so they refused to do it. And so we had, to, we had to rethink really quickly while we were out there, well, how are we going to get this shot? And so we started strategizing and planning and the camels seemed quite com comfortable running along a fence line. So we were like, okay, it's not ideal, but we can make that work. Um, but then, of course, you know, we took one car out there, our camera car, and got that bogged. And um, we're pretty much like, yeah, well, there's the camels being like, told you so. Yes. <laughs> Um, and then, um, and so then we sent our, um, our director of photographers, um, car, Mick McDermott's car out, a, a big Land Rover or Land Cruiser to go and rescue the camel, um, or the, the vehicle with the camera on it. And that got bogged rescuing the other vehicle. So we had four <laughs> vehicles in the middle of this salt flat and yeah, a whole bunch of camels standing around uh, watching us. But that, that's one for you. We yes. Are they're probably just secretly laughing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Who's, who's smarter? <clears throat> we also had, you know, we're traveling um, in a camera vehicle that's traveling at high speeds alongside um, these camels that are running through the desert. And so we ended up getting eight flat tires. Oh. And, um, and actually on the way up, you know, because we transported eight domesticated camels up um, to Mount Magnet. Um, and the camel truck blew a head gasket on the way oh. of the day our shoot. So we had to, I had to call my dad, what, what any good director does, call your dad. Um, yes, yes. He, he got a mate and, you know, they drove another truck up. But because we were in a um, really remote location, we didn't have any cellular reception, so we couldn't send pictures of the tow hitches. So we'd had to describe them over the phone. And um, when they got there, it was the correct hitch, but it was the wrong size. <laughs> it, it couldn't attach. And so we were literally stuck without any ability to transport the camels. And the whole film was about to fall apart. Mm. And we were in this really small town called Payne's Find, which has like literally it's nine people. Just a roadhouse. Just yeah. a roadhouse. All it is. And um, we were like, where are we going to get a truck? 
and this guy called Doug happened to just pull into the town, one of these guys that lives there, and he had the exact truck that we needed. Oh, and, what? <laughs> and this is this calls to the kind of, you know, the Australian spirit that exists in these kind of country areas. Yeah. He was just like, you know what, you guys just have the truck. Have the truck for a week. No charge. You know, just <laughs> to hand over his truck to us, someone he's literally met for two minutes. And to trust us with his vehicle was just incredible. And not just oh, any good shout out to good shout out to Dougie. Good on you, Dougie. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, not just trust us with his vehicle. Trust us with his vehicle towing six camels, who yes. you know, two pounds per camel, um, yeah. across the Australian desert. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Doug. <laughs> your, your, your little heart goes pitter patter, doesn't it? With uh, we can relate to all these. Yeah. Um, vehicle problems when trying to achieve something with camels. I don't know. It's why do we, why is camels attract <laughs> that kind of vehicle trouble? They're just so heavy that they put a lot of pressure on. Them. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's right. Exactly. So from the the day, Alison, that you decided to you quit your job you, to write this script, and um, and you got Brooke on board. So. Before all this, what what do camels mean to you? What was your perception of them? Well, the only um, time that I'd come across wild camels in Australia was working on Outback Truckers. And what was really interesting to me is that um, when I was shooting, and I, so imagine, I, you know, there's 24 episodes in a, in, um, I, I worked on 24 episodes. And so that's a lot of time in, in regional Australia. And we only, I only saw camels once. Mm. Um, and when I heard how many camels there were and there, there were kind of these reports of, oh, there's, a, you know, a million camels in the outback, that just kind of didn't ring true to me because it's I- like, where are they? Yeah. Like, well, how come I've never seen them? But, you know, that aside, that was really the only contact I'd had with camels. Um, and, yeah, I didn't have a special affinity with them or anything like that. Um, but yeah, it was just, you know, I think um, it says a lot about humans, about how we treat animals. And mm -hmm. so um, I think that's what I found so interesting about this story is that we as an audience, um, you know, because there are no words to kind of fill our conceptual brain in, we have to kind of just use our own emotion and, and almost project them onto camels. Um, that we're seeing in the story and they have these such beautiful expressive eyes um, you know and they always say the eyes are the windows to the soul so I think because of that I feel a real connection to them now and and Brooke obviously does as well Brooke yeah. did a lot of um, camel wrangling on yeah. set <laughs> yeah it was quite it was quite beautiful actually like on the first day because we actually cast all each of the camels we went through a, a casting with them and Alison picked the ones that she <laughs> liked for each of the roles that are, are played and so oh, yeah. <laughs> then picked the specific looks and specific character traits and um on the on the first day all of the crew was like oh yeah the camels and then on the second day it was like where's petra and what's claudia doing and sonic come here and what's him you know like how's he and so everybody knew the camels names and could look at them by sight and remember which camel was which and which camel was being helpful and which ones were the ones that really didn't like getting on the float and would take forever and needed a lot of help we had, we had one Diva. <laughs> yeah, we had one diva camel, um, and um, and and her name was was Buddha, um, which is slightly odd because you'd think Buddha would be um, chill, but no. Um, and yeah, so it was it was really special just to see how how much you know they they do have these personalities and these, these characters. I know for for me before the film. My own only interaction with them, with camels, had been driving uh, to, or, or through Alice Springs and through the Northern Territory, and I had seen them in the wild, and I just remember stopping and, and watching them and thinking how beautiful they were. And then, of course, once when I was a kid and we went on a camel ride in, in Broome, and I, I remember feeling quite comfortable and safe on a camel. And I know that I don't necessarily have that experience on, on a horse. I, mm. I, I, I struggle with horses, but with the camels, I felt very, very safe. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. And a lot of people feel that way. I was actually a horse trainer before getting into camels. And 
I just haven't touched a horse since really. Like I love them, they're beautiful, but yeah, camels are, are my thing. <laughs> it's interesting you say that there's a million camels out there and uh, uh, one of the things that uh, is quite clear is that uh, with their doubling rate every eight and a half years or so, it is an issue. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I think that, um, you know, it, it's... It's great to be able to see the emotive side of, you know, how the, the whole process has actually taken place at the moment, and that, you know, culling seems to be the only answer. Have you got any thoughts on the, you know, sort of answers since having done the film on uh, what could be done to keep the numbers in check so that our environment and our ecosystems are maintained? Yes. I mean, it- because it's interesting because you are dealing with an animal that's an introduced species. Um, and so there are those elements of, you know, what, what impact are they having on the natural environment? But we found um, that the impact was more on um, man-made structures, like um, infrastructure, like fences and pipelines. Um, and if that's happening, that means that the camels are in a place where they can be trucked out, you know. Um, so to me, there is um, a real now natural resource that we should be exploiting. Um, you know, camel dairy, the, the camel wrangler that we were working with, Chris O'Hora, he has a camel dairy and he's been um, exploring the use of camel milk in dealing with kids with autism. Mm. He's been having an incredible amount of success because of the sheer um, high amount of probiotics in cam- camel milk. Yeah. I think the highest, the highest probiotic source naturally, as far as I understand it. So to me, there's a lot of opportunities that aren't being exploited. And the, the kind of the argument against those um, kind of industries has always been, oh, the camels are too hard to get to. But whenever there's a drought, the camels leave the desert interior and come t- for water. And yes. that's when it's causing all of this damage. And so if there was, um, you know, a way to incentivize, the, these, incentivize these communities that are really remote but are accessible by truck to, to kind of put them in a pen, um, then I think that they really could be used. Absolutely. Look, I I couldn't agree with you more. And uh, what I find is one of the major hurdles that uh, that needs to be overcome is the red tape. Uh, In that the laws as they stand, because they're classed as a feral animal, uh, you trap or capture uh, these feral animals into yards you have to do something with each and every one of those animals. And so the coordination, if we have, a, so, so for example, if there's a client overseas who wants 2,000 camels, female, around about four or five years old, um, it's okay to think, okay, well, we'll just go out there and muster a trap. Or as you say, you know, near the infrastructure that's water and, uh, and fencing, obviously, um, but then, you know, you get a, a herd of camels, you know, maybe 3,000 camels, but half of them are bulls. Now, what are you going to do with those 1,500 bulls? And, uh, you know, because you've got to do something with it. You can't re-release. And uh, I think that's one of the main hurdles that, uh, you know, has stopped the industry from actually progressing. Yeah, people have tried it for sure. And that's why I think films like, that's why we were so excited to connect with you guys and, and speak with you is, you know, it's um, it's a short film, but it's I, from everything that I've seen and how, and all the awards you've got. Oh, oh I, yeah. I, well, have, have you been able to keep count of them all? <laughs> have you had to build another cabinet? <laughs> <laughs> it's been a pretty amazing experience. Um, and I guess, you know, Brooke and I really consider ourselves kind of tourists in the whole camel industry because 
that, that's not our livelihood. You know, we're filmmakers and we were drawn to this because of the story. Mm. Um, and, you know, we've come to understand a little bit about how things work within the camel industry just by talking to a lot of people and doing a lot of research. But we're by no means experts. Um, so, yeah, we, we're just kind of really grateful to have um, been a, a part of the telling of this story, which for us, I think, is really about connection and that the tragedy of kind of, um, you know, when you can't connect with the mm -hmm. people. That yeah, for sure. It's so easy to dissociate yourself from what's really happening, whatever it is in the world. But, I mean, we, we always get quite surprised at how many people with it, Australian citizens who still don't know that we have feral camels. Um, so this sort of film... Sorry, what were you going to say, Brooke? Oh, that's definitely come up for us too. When we, we've been touring the film around the world, and even within Australia, people have, have said to us, oh, we had no idea. And Australia really? now has the richest sources of, of, of camels internationally. And, you know, people in the Middle East want the camels here because they've got such, <laughs> strong, um, such, such strong DNA because of the way that they've been able to yeah. arrive here. So... Um, yeah, it is, uh, you know, and, and that's why I suppose film and the arts is, is a really great medium to be able to speak to issues such as this and to be able to make, make waves and, and make changes in industries where, uh, where, you know, otherwise it wouldn't be able to happen. Absolutely. Yeah. And look, I mean, you know, it is definitely, um, as I said, I think that, you know, something has to be done to maintain the numbers and a systematic approach is needed. Um, but surely there's a way of using something like the Judas Collar uh, to make it so that they're not being culled and left on the desert floor, um, you know, to find these herds. Um, the, the desert's a big place. I mean, you know, I, I've walked across it, you know, it's a, a, and <laughs> as you say, you know, like um, you, you're on these journeys and you don't see any camels at all because all you're looking at as you're traveling across the country is a hairline. Mm -hmm. uh, it's such a big country. It's a big paddock out there, but they're out there and they are multiplying and, uh, but we could use such technology as the Judas Collar to find the camels, muster them up, so systematically removing them so that the ecosystems are uh, maintained, you know, for the native animals and plants. That's exactly right. And, and one of the interesting things that we discovered talking to a few of the people who had um, been around the areas where there had been a lot of this culling using the Judas collars is that they said that the population of wild dogs had hugely increased Absolutely. as a result of just this massive amount of food that was suddenly just available for eating. And yeah. they're hugely detrimental to the native flora and fauna. So yeah. I think it's, it's such a complex issue and not one that we have the answers to, but we're hoping that the film kind of starts to get the conversation going again. It highlights an aspect of an industry that's been created, but it co it's so costly, these culls, without any benefit, really, except the numbers are down for a short period of time in a certain area too. I mean, the cost, of, as you are saying on one of your trailers, the cost of your helicopter, huge. Yeah. It's huge. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So these culls are very expensive too. Yeah. And, and the there's camels, no benefit. The camels are so intelligent and herd driven. And really that's the way that we were able to make this film was kind of drawing on the camels desire to kind of stay together with the group. Um, so I think there, there, there is a way and Australians are so resourceful um, when it comes to these, these, Kind of issues. I think we just need to, yeah, to come up with something. something Take a bit more notice. Yeah. So I have, um, so I have a question about um, Alison. When you quit your job and you wrote this script, what was your initial vision or expectation for this film? Well, it was interesting. The, the first couple of drafts that I wrote had a, um, a human protagonist, um, a woman who was lost in the Australian outback, and she comes across this this Judas camel um and you know through kind of 
following this camel comes to realize what what um, is happening and then finds safety through the helicopter but it was just never as good as the actual story of the camel itself and so um, eventually um, the the script turned into this no dialogue um, you know camel's perspective and which was a terrifying thing to write knowing that um, we were going to have do this <laughs> you know and we had no idea how it could actually happen and you know, we we talked to a lot of um, camel people and some some people said that it would be impossible um, you know others just thought it would take a very long time um, and we ended up found, finding um, a, a camel wrangler Chris O'Hara at the Kalamunda Camel Farm just outside of Perth who he had domesticated camels that would star in the like nativity scenes at Christmas and he'd do camel rides. So they were domesticated, but they couldn't um, perform without ropes. So what we realized that we could do was separate one camel from the rest of the herd and let the camel kind of walk back to the herd and we would position our camera in between and, and kind of catch what was going on. Yes. So I think, um, you know, in my wildest dreams, I thought we could um, get something and maybe build it in the edit. But actually, we were able to really stick to our storyboards and the script in the field, which was just incredible. Um, and just kind of having a team that knew that some shots might take four hours and some shots might happen the first go. And you're just thinking, can they actually hear us? Are they yes. listening? Like, are we now just directing them and they're performing? Um, yes. So, but, yeah, just having that kind of, um, I guess, the support of the crew who were all super involved in handling the camels. I mean, there wasn't anyone on set who wasn't either building a pen for the camels or leading a camel over here or helping, you know, feed them or mm, yeah, that So did you, did you have... Um... Did you have an expectation on how far this film might get or, or was it just kind of like, I'll do it and see what happens? Yeah, very much so. I think, um, you know, you're always setting out to just make the best film that you can at every stage. And you kind of almost have to forget, like when you're in the field and it's hot, you're just kind of thinking about surviving, getting through the shoot. And then you're like, oh, my God, we've got the whole edit ahead of us. Of us. And you, okay, then you just focus on that. And then that's done. And you're like, oh, my God, we're going to do the sound and the great. Like, it's just, it's kind of never ending. And, um, you know, after we won the Austin Film Festival, uh, that meant that we've become Oscar qualified. So we're in the mix um, for Best Live Action Short. So now we're in LA doing these screenings and trying to kind of get some publicity and trying to get the film out there. Yeah, which is crazy. never expected that. So yeah, it's been a crazy adventure. Yeah, and, uh, I mean, the t the type of film you guys have made is like, you know, I mean, there's animal films out there, of course, but it's not a Hollywood film where it's focused on romance or violence or drama or something like that. So you guys amazing. are doing amazing. Oh, well, actually, we'll speak to um, your, your comment just now. And um, I think there is something for, I think people are hunting for new stories and unique stories. And I think that this, this one, you know, it is, it has taken a different perspective, but it is talking about something that is really human, which is the importance of connection and the importance of community. And I think Look, ultimately, you know, there's a lot of a lot of things that you can read into why this film is doing well about that exists within our, our current, you know, social media existence where we're a lot more isolated. Um, and there's so many narratives and ideas and experiences that you can read into it as, as a person. And so that's, you know, it's it, it's why it's really resonating with with a lot of people, which we're so incredibly grateful for. Mm. Uh, it seems like it's working on a lot of le levels then. Yeah, so we're so lucky for that. And yeah. we're so excited to be able to kind of share it with the world on like, November 4th to 14th because it's, you know, when you make a short film, it's you kind of, you're at this festival over here and then this festival over here and it's really actually quite hard for people to catch it. Um, yes. And to know it's actually just out there for the world for 10 days to see um, is pretty exciting. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, that brings to a great point. So people will want to see this film because, like, I mean, just the trailers, like really, uh, d the way that it's it was it's been 
filmed, edited, directed, like you can just feel the power even in the trailer and um, like I do a bit of filming myself, nowhere near the magnitude that you guys do. But, you know, when you capture, capture something really great, you're just like, yes, I think this is going to draw people in and um, people want to see this. So um, the dates, so is it, a couple of questions, is it going to be available online to every country? Yes. yes. Yeah, so okay. worldwide, and it's going to be on Vimeo, YouTube, Facebook, um, so a lot of different platforms so people can kind of share it or access it, um, and it'll also be on our website, which is www.judascola.com. Okay, tell us the date. That, so it's available for 10 days between... It's November 4th to the 14th, 2019, and um, if people want... You know, I'm never going to miss it. They can sign up to um, Judas Collar on Facebook and we'll be doing lots of announcements. We're also on Instagram and Twitter um, and or also there's a spot on our website where you can just pop your details in and we'll send you an email when the film's ready to be watched. Okay, so do people, is it, is it do you people rent it or is it just going to be available for free? It's free. Be free, um, so it'll be free for ten days. Just um, so you'll be, be able to watch it um, just on the internet. Mm. Um, you'll need to be connected, um, and yeah, after that, it'll probably be available to um, to watch through. Like um, you know, you'd pay to watch it. We yes. just rules with the academy that it can't be around. Um, yeah, uh, I can see that there'll be a lot of. Um, uh, a lot of boxes of tissues being used in uh, everyone watching this film because it is a very emotive thing. Um, and there's no narrative. So there's no narrative. That so. just leaves a hole open. I think when someone doesn't feel like they're being narrated to in a movie, they're like, oh, how am I supposed to feel? What am I feeling? These are weird feelings. <laughs> well, that's their own voice talking, yeah. isn't it, then? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, which is a brilliant way of doing something like this. It's just brilliant. Thank you guys so much for having us. Yeah. So I have I have um, a final question. You you mentioned briefly that um, sometimes when creating short films, it can be a call or sort of like a test to a, a larger film or a full length film. Is this something that is is in the pipe work for Judas Collar, or you just what what what's the feel around this? So I think um, when we made this film, we knew that it was just going to be a short. Um, you know, we felt that the story was the, the length of a short. Um, so we don't have plans to turn this into a feature. Um, we feel that it's, you know, it exists in its best form as a short. Um, so, but we're both exploring kind of other feature options um, because that, as filmmakers, that's kind of the next progression. Um, but for Judas Collar, we, we just love it as a short. Yeah. Wow. Fantastic. So you guys are in LA at the moment. What's it going to take for you guys to get, get to the Oscars? A lot of help. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us what you need. <laughs> Well, we need, we need people to watch it on the 4th and start talking to other people and sharing it and letting letting everybody know so that the right people all around the world, so Academy members who, who have the opportunity to make a difference, are, are filmmakers from all over the world that have done something to be recognised by the Academy. And so who knows where these people might be? And, um, and so it's, you know, our job to make sure that the film gets out there, as many people as possible see it, so that the, the right people are able to, to, to know about the film, to, to yeah. know that, they, that it, you know, can be voted on, so that it can be part of, yeah, yeah the next stage. But, well, yeah, I suppose also that, that too, you're making your own contacts as well for, you know, possible future um you know movies that you might make or films or whatever so it's a, it's a great thing you're doing it's awesome yeah this is it it's the beginning of something great thanks so much yeah. we also do have a little gofundme page and also yeah. with the australian cultural fund yeah which is tax deductible um on our website if people do want to help with the campaign which just goes into um we're working with a publicist at the moment we're kind of making behind the scenes stuff and we want to pay um people that we're working with so that yes 
Yeah. And I also want to take this moment to acknowledge you two as women who have written and produced this film because let's face it, you know, I don't know what the percentage is, but the percentage of women filmmakers is low compared to the male filmmakers. So not only have you, you written it, produced it, filmed it, edited it, everything, but also it sounds like it's just, it's, this film is just an incredible impact that that message could only have come from you guys. Like a lot of people say, like a lot of people make it, all these different films, but there's only certain people that that can come from. And um, I really appreciate you two for being women and putting yourself out there and just going, we're going to make this happen. And then all this amazing stuff has followed with awards and, um, you know, I hope, you will get to the Oscars, <laughs> and and in the and also you got a chance to be with Camels, um, yes. and it sounds like you're pretty hooked. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like you're a hook line ticket. I, 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 I think I had withdrawals after the film. I went up to the Camel Farm just to say hello to them all again. <laughs> yes, yeah. that's a real thing. But it's also people like um, like you two who make these films and people who have those ideas to just do anything with camels. It doesn't matter what, even mm. if they just want them as pets. It do, in Australia, it's like if you have a camel and it has not been bred, you know, it, and it's come, it come as a feral camel, you're doing everybody a favour, you know. And it's sort of like, yeah, it's, it might be only one or two. Or, like all our camels, we've got ten of them. They've all come as feral um or sometimes we got pregnant ones that were feral and you know they had babies but um you know it, in australia it's like well if you have a camel you've basically saved them from so many of our camels could have ended up you know being in fact, yeah all the camels that i've had uh when i was uh, well when i did my expedition the two-year expedition um, across australia all of those camels, if I hadn't have got them, they would have been shot in the same sort of manner that this Judas collar would have you know, introduced, every single one of them. And I've had them now for, oh, it's getting closer towards 20 years now, or 18, 18 19 years. Um, and they're my best friends. Yeah, yeah. You know? beautiful, beautiful animals. Yeah, yeah. So, it is important that, you know, we, we get this right, I think, eventually. And uh, a movie such as The Judas Collar is showing, you know, well, for number one, the technology that's available of finding the herds. But secondly, what we're currently doing with that technology. And, uh, you know, it can be better. And we know that. Yeah. So good on you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And thank you so much for getting this out to all of the community because we don't have, you know, we've got a few contacts, but you guys would know so many people. So really thank appreciate you. It. And the best way to get a camel film out is to tell camel people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Are you a new camel owner or are you considering owning camels? Look no further for an alternative gentle camel training method. Forget all the heavy-handed and dominance-based camel training styles. We'll show you another way. Get camel confident with your camel training and handling skills. Get our free camel training ebooks and videos over at camelconnection.com.